by being early for comic books this week here on Clubhouse with myself and Dr. Stanford Carpenter, comic book anthropologist. Uh, Stanford, do we do any pre banter or are we ready to uh, uh, jump into the content here? I'm ready to jump in. I mean, I know that you loved everything that I read, so, uh, you know, let's get at it. Oh, Stanford, why are you like this? <laughs> Uh, we're going to be reviewing comic books on a scale that will go from buy to it was okay, which is honorable mentions, to meh, to no, just no, uh, and we'll be looking at a number of books. Where would you like to begin, Doctor? Oh, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, why don't we? Why don't we start with? Um, hmm. Let's start with DC. Um, right. Let's pick up with Shazam number two. Which had very little Shazam in it. All right, that's fair if that's what you'd like to do. Um, yeah, uh, I'm not. I'm convinced that there is not a real understanding of what to do with this franchise. I'm convinced that a lot of things in, that go on with Shazam and DC Comics are that go right are luck, like Trials of Shazam, or uh, like certain elements of the movie, and that certain other things they're stuck with, and they don't want to let the copyrights expire, and they keep trying to make them work, and it's not doing it so here uh shazam goes to hell and that couldn't possibly be a good idea it literally could not possibly be a good idea because it goes all canto bite on you and maybe a little dash of legends of tomorrow and i was like i'm not really sure why this is happening because even in the story it doesn't make sense it doesn't add up to get to where you're supposed to be so yeah. you know wh whenever i don't know what to do with my life what i do is i just go to hell <laughs> That's that. That's pretty much that. that that's pretty much what, what I feel is happening here. I agree with you that that DC had a lot of trouble figuring out what to do with Shazam. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that the problem is not knowing what to do with Shazam in this book. I think it's just not knowing what to do. Ooh. Um, it's um, you're right. We we, we we hardly see Shazam. Um, there's not a really, there's not really a very interesting explanation. There's a couple of good tidbits, you know, like the whole thing with Billy Batson running into, running into the, into the demon's daughter and all that stuff. That, that was, that was actually kind of fun and kind of ironic. We're not talking about Talia, but, though. It's no. It's important to be no. clear. <laughs> and, but, but in the end, I felt like, I, I, I felt like, like we spent this, you know, we start off in this, you know, in a casino in hell and... I didn't feel like they were able to really do much with the casino. I felt like they were just killing space with the casino. Yeah. Um, they could they could have done that in one page and then and then kept it moving. But if you don't know where you're going, you know th there is no keeping it moving. True. Yeah. And that that is a s s consistent concern. Uh, part of the alleged rationale for why we're not seeing more Shazam is because Billy's powers are on the fritz. And Billy's powers are on the fritz because the lightning bolts come from the Rock of Eternity, and the Rock of Eternity is stuck in hell. So Billy figures he's going to go to hell and get the Rock of Eternity. Except he didn't fact. Well, there's a lot of things that aren't factored in here. First of all, the idea of lifting up something the size of oh, I don't know a city block and uh, logistically safely getting it intact from a different plane of reality he's to your own. He's got the powers of Atlas. Atlas can lift a world. He can lift a rock. No, he's got the stamina of Atlas. And it's not so much about the lifting, it's about the structural integrity. <laughs> and again, it's also about the... Now, I will allow that if you use the power of Zeus, jumping from one dimension to another probably may be feasible. I won't, I won't say that's not. But I would say that Billy Batson doesn't know that, for one, and Billy Batson's powers don't always work for two. Yeah, but Billy didn't, didn't jump them to hell. It was his friend. Yes, but I'm saying getting back he, right. He, does he think this mage of his? Because first of all, he thinks his friend is a half-wit mage who's barely powered up, who barely even fits in at uh, Teen Titans Academy. First of all, so uh, does he really think? Oh yeah, this guy's going to be able to help me teleport the entire Rock of Eternity back to my own home reality dimension. Sure. Well, obviously he does. <laughs> but 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 that's because he has not activated his powers he's not channeling the wisdom of solomon he's not you know? <laughs> so so yeah i mean I, what what frustrates me what eternally frustrates me about about the the kind of like the the weird storylines we see around shazam and weird isn't necessarily bad but i mean weird in a bad way right yeah bad weird is that is that um 
Shazam's appeal is so simple, right? Shazam's sh what what makes Shazam work for the reader is so is so bloody simple that I can't believe that that, that, that the writers keep missing it. Yeah. And it comes down to it comes down to two words: wish fulfillment. Yeah. You know, there's nothing here anybody Superman, would wish for. Yeah. Right, because super think about it. Superman comes along. And it's when you look at Superman, you're wondering what it would be like to be Clark Kent and what it would be like to be Superman, right? Mm -hmm. Billy Batson is the audience. Billy Batson is like a is like is a, is a teenage kid, and he gets transformed into something else, right? He gets True. transformed like 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 Billy Batson is the reader. Mm. But that's apparently a hard uh, a hard out. peg to fit in the hole. Well, it's it's not not hard. You, you, You're fading out you on me. You write alone. Billy Batson as the reader, and then you transform into Shazam. But they can't do that, no. you know. Right. So, so yeah, I, I'm glad that we, I'm glad that, that, that we're doing this one first. What would be your rating for this on a from a by honorable mention, meh or no, just no? Uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna say meh, and that's only because I really like the idea of Shazam, and I'm hoping and praying that somehow they can turn it around. I would also say meh, mostly because literally the second I stop talking about this, I'm gonna have a hard time remembering what happened. Um, it's it's very forgettable, and as such, uh, not leaving an impression on me. That's a strong meh indicator for me. Okay. So let's go on to the let's go to the next DC title. Okay. Superman and the Authority. All right. The first thing I'm starting to realize about this, continuity? No, we're not doing that. <laughs> this is some uh, offshoot variant of, of the DC Universe. It's not what we call, look at as DC, what, what are they called now? Earth Zero, which uh, writer Stephen Grant said, do they realize how deprecating that name is? How, how that makes them look? And I'm like, you know, I don't believe they actually realize that. But that's where... The main stuff happens, so you know, yay. Um, I, I, I so first of all, there's that. Uh, the things that are happening here will not affect other things that you probably know. Uh, Superman is depowered, which is uh, very contrary to the original idea of what happens to him as he got older. Um, and he is um, still able to do some stuff, but he's you know not up to super snuff. So he's recruiting help. He's getting Apollo, and he's getting Midnighter, and he's getting. Uh, steals, steals niece Natasha and he's getting uh, Manchester Black and okay but this is a recruitment montage that's not a story that's an element in a story and for me I was like okay it's a cute re recruitment montage but it's a little you know just kind of driving all over the road not really not really with any real you know impetus to it if you see what I'm saying I, I, I see you, and I, I feel kind of the same way about this. I'm like, what, what's the story? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, what's the story, Morning Glory? I mean, we're just, you know, it's just him walking around. And what, what kind of bothers me about this whole narrative about how he's depowered, right? Yeah. Is this depowered version of Superman is still more powerful than most of the people sitting in that universe. True so story. Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm, I'm frustrated with the like, oh my God, you know. He's still faster than a speeding bullet, but only ten times as fast instead of eleven times as fast. You know, it's like it's like, oh, you're losing a step because you're nigh omnipotent. <laughs> you know, I'm just I, I I I need to. I'm trying to figure out why we why we should care. Mm -hmm. Why? And and when I say why we should care, I mean. Why should we be concerned? What what is the new what is the heightened threat that demands the assemblage of the authority? Like like I don't get it. it. It just seems to come out of nowhere. It's like, "Oh, there's old Superman and he's lost a step, but he's still a million steps ahead." Zaddy Superman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not really sure any of the why here because it's it's a formal, near it's adversaries. Yeah, it's a near continuity because he talks about, you know, oh, it's you and not your son because clearly John is flying around as the second Superman, which is fine. I don't have a beef with that. But, you know, this is not uh, standard continuity stuff, uh, as we saw with the Mr. Miracle book. It, if I understand the business side of it, these were books that were contracted and in this case even produced years ago. 
that did not get published due to editorial uh, politics in DC. And now they're just sitting on their hands and trying to figure out how to make money off of this because they don't want to write it off. You know, it's like, oh, we have a Grant Morrison book and he's going to stop write, writing comic books, so we need to squeeze some money out of this, even if it doesn't make any sense now. So. Yeah, I think that they missed their opportunity in, you know, they should have just gone on the editorial direction that they wanted to, taken all these old books and packaged them as like an Elseworld miniseries. Or even a TPB, you're right, yeah. Just, I mean, like, yeah. doing this in the monthly, especially, does it a great disservice. Because we didn't even finish the recruitment montage. It's like, how are you going to start a montage and not finish it in a whole book? What you doing? Wasting time, wasting space, and racking in the dough. Mm, I don't like it. Not a fan. No. I, 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 you know what? I'm, I've gone past mad to no, just no. You know, I respect that. This is still for me because, again, I'm going to forget it. Um, this is still going to be a meh for me. I'm not offended. I can think of many, many books where I'm like, no, this offends my sensibilities and this has to be stopped. Um, this is, you're, you're a, little, a little angrier than I, but I respect that. Well, yeah, I mean, it's just, I'm, I, I'll be honest, I'm getting kind of frustrated with with what DC is doing right now. It's like, on one hand, I, I don't mind the idea of a company just throwing things on the wall to see what sticks, but they're doing it in the messiest way possible. Um, and, you know, it's like, it's like they've got this new continuity that they haven't explained. They've got this, all the stuff they haven't explained. And, and in actuality, like this, this new approach to continuity has actually made the books more confusing than any of the prior options. Yeah, I mean, I think part of it comes from uh, the editorial structure. Basically, right now, looks like each group editor is a king unto himself, and uh, the fiefdoms are different. So, for example, the Green Lantern shop looks better than it ever has. You know, the Batman shop is treading water. The Superman shop, eh, I'm not really sure what you're doing there. So, but none of them have to connect with the other. None of them have to play along because. For example, you know, the magistrate and fascism rising in Gotham with no repercussions anywhere else is like, okay, I guess that's what you're going to do. Sure. I mean, we're not really an interconnected line that way. And we're playing fast and loose with continuity in that regard, especially time. Right. Times. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think that, I, I, I mean, I honestly think that crisis on him. I, well, first of all, I thought that the idea of having multiple Earths was, a, was satisfying, right? I understand it started to get confusing, and I really enjoy Crisis, right? Mm -hmm. But when it reached the point where you were doing a new version of Crisis every five years, that's when it started to get, it, it, we're, we're like, it's getting messier and messier and messier, you totally. know? I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's kind of like, it's kind of like they've gone from sweeping, from, from sweeping up the piles of dirt to just spreading them around. <laughs> that's a metaphor that's got some legs to it. All right, uh, this is Comic Books This Week on Clubhouse from the It's Complicated Club with Dr. Stanford Carpenter and myself, Hannibal Taboo, head comics reviewer at Bleeding Cool. What will be next up on our travelogue of reviews, Stanford? Let's do Nightwing. Oh, okay, okay. I'm going to let you go for it. What did you think of Nightwing? Let's talk about this. <laughs> what did I think of Nightwing? Well, you know, I, I really wasn't, wasn't hyped about reading it until someone, until someone else put me on it. Mm -hmm. um, I... I, it was it was really interesting. I I felt like this is gonna sound weird. I felt like like we could judge this book by its cover. <laughs> You're fair, okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, because you know, it, it's Nightwing. He's swinging behind the scenes. He's changing clothes, and then he comes down. He seems he, he's going down these stairs, and now he's at a podium saying, "My name is Dick Grayson, and I have an idea." Mm -hmm. Right. That's fair, um, fair assessment of the book. And that, that is basically the book, right? He starts off and he's trapped in an apartment with his sister and um, Blockbuster comes, you know, Blockbuster breaks in and they go to the roof and that one's like, you know what? I can't fight you right now. So he, he had a head injury, yeah. Right. Well, you know, um, you can always fight. It's just a matter of whether you can win or lose, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> But so, and then he did this weird thing where he swung around a helicopter, which Dope. I didn't quite understand. How do you dodge the blades of a helicopter? 
Oh, you're misreading it. The okay. Okay, first of all, I love the sequence, first of all. Oh, uh, the, oh, I'm looking at it right now. I guess so he swings in underneath the blades of the yes, helicopter? So he swings in underneath the entire helicopter. So the blades are pointing at the sky. He swings underneath closer to the ground. He, it's it's a it's a killer sequence. Like I was like reverse engineering it. Like oh my god, this is so good, Bruno Redondo. How have you done this? It was right. really like really sick to me. But I I like that like afterwards he's going around he's seeking advice and one of the things I think is interesting about Nightwing as a character mm -hmm. is that he's so deeply connected to the DCU. Um, in ways that even Batman isn't. Yes. Um, and he's kind of like, he's the child of Batman, but he's actually somewhat well-adjusted. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, and and he keeps going to each one saying, oh, well, I've been thinking of this, I want your advice, and then it, it builds up to, to him getting on a stage saying, you know, hey, I'm Dick Grayson, and I'm a billionaire now, and I have an idea, right? And I thought that was thing. I thought that was interesting. Pardon? I, I, he said, "Yeah, I'm going to do a thing," and that, and that thing for me was very interesting because I've talked a lot about uh, negatively a lot about the cyclical nature of superheroes, about a lot of the the endless war on crime and everything, and the fact that especially for Batman, it really doesn't seem to matter. That here, uh, and this is the first thing I'm going to talk about here. Dick Grayson has found a war that he could fight and that he could conceivably win. He's got a target. He's got a measurable metric that he can study by. He's got a limited scope for it. And even Superman said it's like, it's not limited. It, it's not too small. It's focused. It's brilliant. <laughs> Which was uh, uh, one, the second thing I'm going to get to. The characterization that we did here, there was the scene with Superman is fantastic. It's a great character piece. Um, as you said, the, the experts and the people he went to go look, talk to, the connection that he had to the DC Universe shows that he's smart enough to know what he does not know. He's smart enough to put together the pieces and that's how he will win this war. That's how he'll win this specific war in a way that Batman, who, when he enters, intervenes in the book ultimately, even it was like, I don't, I don't think Batman thought he could pull this off. And he's supposed to be this genius level intellect. So... Watching that was fantastic. Watching that that confluence of things. Then, like I said, there's the uh, ongoing storyline with the new sister thing, which at first I was very concerned about. But then I remembered how I was very concerned about Blue Beetle in their Suicide Squad book from the same creative team and how well that turned off. So I'm like, you know what? You get some credit. I'm going to believe you could pull this off. Let's see where you're going. Uh, and then, like I said, there was the action scene. That helicopter scene, man, I just want to just study this scene, the way he does this, because Blockbuster has control of the police, and the police come shooting for him. Nightwing runs at the helicopter, whoosh, whoosh, two grappling hooks into two cops, uh, uses their weight to swing around the helicopter underneath it, kicks the two of them out, puts two more grappling hooks on, two more, throws them out the other side, and then the last cop who's the pilot, like, you know what, man, I surrender. I can't, I'm not messing with you. I'm not going to do this. And <laughs> all of a sudden, he's flying off in the helicopter with four cops hanging from the bottom of it. I'm like, that's dope. That's <laughs> amazeballs. Wow. I mean, it, it, it was a good sequence, I got to admit. But I actually, my favorite scene was the scene afterwards. Where um, where he where he goes into into Barbara Gordon's window and he's like I'm okay I'm okay and then um, and then Robin's like you're on the floor and then he's like I'm okay on the floor <laughs> and he just lays there and then they drag him to bed right mild correction I, that's actually his apartment she's visiting but yeah oh I'm I'm sorry no, yeah you're, you're right um, but I think what's great about it is that's just one of those scenes we don't see usually they're coming back and they're beat to crap and then they got to be healed. But this is just, you know what? Swinging under helicopters, taking on Blockbuster, it's exhausting. It's a lot. <laughs> and that's right? why she's so, like, good morning. He's like, oh, wow, I thought I'd sleep longer. You've been asleep for two days. What? <laughs> you know, I mean, I thought, so, so I, I like that. I like that. But, but yeah, the one thing, the, uh, th this is my one knock on this. Mm -hmm. um, as much as I like this issue, his ultimate idea was something that would, that's been implied that other rich superheroes are already doing. That's not true. Which is starting a, well, the whole the whole starting a foundation thing, right? 
I'm like, because well, it's been implied. It's, it's been implied that like that that Bruce Wayne has a foundation where True. he's flo- throwing a lot of money around. True. So I wanted more about what makes this foundation a little bit um, a little bit different, right? Okay. Um, and that that's that that's that's the thing, and that's something that I think that I think will be will be teased out a little bit. I mean, I think that it I think that it solves a problem for Nightwing, which is they keep putting him in these jobs that don't work well with being Nightwing. Yeah, right. I'm a bartender. You know? I'm oh, a cabbie. I'm, gonna, I'm a this. Mm-hmm. I'm a cop, right? You mm-hmm. know, I thought the best was for a moment for a hot moment he was a writer. Mm-hmm. You know, he was like a freelance writer. There's a reason why Superman works so well as a um, as a journalist because. They have some flexible hours. <laughs> now, as a former journalist, I can say they really don't. But, <laughs> but you, you know what I mean, like, 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 um, and especially if you, if, if instead of a journalist, he's a novelist, right? They just said he was a writer. They didn't say what he was writing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but, but I think, you know, but I think that like that, that's actually, you know, just a better idea for him. Like, 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 make him a novelist. Make him, oh, a philanthropist. That makes sense. Because he doesn't have to be around all the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and for for um, me, well, the best job for him was a spy when he was with Spiral. That was my favorite Dick Grayson. Um, but I do see your point there, and I do see the concern uh, with the book. Um, for me, well, and, and I'll spoil this, this, this idea, basically. I'll spoil it. That uh, the idea is Dick Grayson is going to use a billion dollars to eradicate, eradicate poverty in Bloodhaven. Not anywhere else, not in Gotham, not in, just in Bloodhaven, he's going to eradicate poverty, and he's going to use this foundation to do it. That's a clear goal that can right. clearly be done and measured and accomplished if you have a billion dollars. That's totally, totally what it, because Bloodhaven doesn't even have like, it's not Metropolis, it's not Gotham, it doesn't have like, like several, several millions of people. It's got maybe like a couple million people. I mean, it's basically Newark, New Jersey, right? Exactly. If you had a billion dollars and said, I'm going to fix Newark, New Jersey, you could do that. That's doable. Right. And right. That's, the that's only what problem I said. is once you fix it, you have so many people moving. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, if you lived in Gotham, wouldn't you move? I'm just saying. <laughs> no, I mean, once you fix it, people would move to your place. That's what I'm saying. People from Gotham are uh, Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I mean, I look. Kudos. I like it. I like that they took something. I, I like that they took something simple and put it in the book. I like that I actually could judge this book by the cover. Mm-hmm. I didn't know I could when I when I when I first started opening it. But by the time I got there, I'm like, wow, the cover really was the book. Here we go. In a in a very cool, subtle way, not in like, not in not not in like an over the top annoying way. Agreed. You know. I, I thought it was. A, I, th- I I thought this was a really good. I thought this was a really good book. I I, I put it in, on the in the buy pile. I too would put it on the buy pile. That's cool, cool, cool. So yeah, I, I was a big. I was very pleasantly surprised because Tom Taylor, he's a clever guy. He's got some ideas, y'all. He's. I'm very. I'm very interested in that guy. He's very good. Yep. So what's next? Um. Well, I guess we can. I guess we can. We can leave DC. Okay. Um, Bad DC. Let's let's hit Marvel. Uh, someone should. <laughs> well, let's let's rip the bandaid off. Let's go straight to the straight to the X verse. Um, let's do it. Let's start with the Way of X number five. Oh my spirit, the Way of X. Tell okay. me, preach your love for this book. If if love was if love was wrath, then yes, that would be what I have for this book. Um, the idea of Nightcrawler and this really sloppy attempt at creating reconciliation between uh, Lost and Fabian Cortez and the real messiness that comes from it. Okay, here's the thing. The whole, this stuff, we're doing this on Mars. There's this great thing. We're going to do this on Mars. It's going to be this great emotional beat. And then something really big happens. Something really, really big where, I mean, I guess we can spoil it, whatever. The moon of Phobos starts to fall at Mars, right? Now, saying that out loud, that sounds like, wow, this should be an amazing visual spectacle. Nope. It's done in, like, really small panels and not with a lot of detail and not with any real scale. So they tell you the moon is falling, but the art doesn't really give you a moon falling kind of vibe. Uh, You know, oh, God, this is a cataclysmic planet-destroying disaster. 
after we just literally terraformed this planet like last week. Um, I was disappointed by that. Uh, there was also a lot of yelling. There was a lot of uh, uh, pointless frippery here. And ultimately, the uh, spiritual malaise that the mutant nation is facing uh, does nothing but get worse here. Uh, the way, if this is the way, then it's the wrong way. And <laughs> I'm, I don't have any problem saying that. Well, I'm going to start by saying I think that, that of this five-issue miniseries, that this was probably the best issue. Yay. Um, that still puts it at barely a meh. Um, you know, I mean, I, one thing I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to give, give this book props for a few things mm -hmm. for the, of all of the issues. It's the first one that said, this is what Nightcrawler is doing. This is the problem that he's solving. And he actually works his way through that problem. Now he gets foiled at the end, right? Yeah, that was funny. That it was kind of funny the way he gets foiled at the end, like 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 that, that like and and that and that he he gets the solution, and then the solution is kind of taken away from him. But I thought it was interesting because I felt like this was the most coherent of all of the issues. Like like True. when you read some of the previous issues, you really don't have a sense of what the mission is, True. what the idea behind the book is. This one was like, boom, okay, we're trying to get at this third law. <laughs> about respecting the land, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, for the first time. And then in, in there he says, I'm not trying to found a religion. I'm just trying to figure out, like, what kind of culture we can have going forward. Oh, okay. This is new. Now I know that, too. Oh, he like, actually I said that in the first issue. He said that same you, sentence. You know, but it didn't, it, didn't, it didn't resonate in the first one because they didn't have anything going on that backed it up. True. And that's the problem. So, so it's like I, I was like, this should have been the first issue. Would have if this had been the, this if this had been the first issue, then they could have built something. But it was just I, I you know, and 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 what I also thought was kind of cheap about it was the very end was like was like, oh, this is a setup for the next mini series. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, so this is a five. Basically, really, this is a five issue setup for something else. A trailer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not a fan. It of was that. a trailer that was so heavy, the truck couldn't pull it. In a world <laughs> where Mars's moon falls and you won't care. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, so yeah. I mean, I'm gonna give this one a met just because it was the best of a five issue series. I will give this one. And a it had met. my favorite character in it. I thought your favorite character was Green Air. I mean, Connor Hawk. Oh, I'm talking about uh, my favorite X Men is Nightcrawler, though. Oh, okay, okay, okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, mine, oh. is, mine is actually Exodus. I really like Exodus. But anyway. Oh, um, okay. So, uh, yeah, I, I would give this a meh as well. Because, like I said, if you can make me not remember really. Like, when we started talking about this, I barely remember the Phobos thing. And I was like, oh, yeah, that did happen. Oh, that, oh no, that's not good. Uh -huh. So, yeah, this would be a meh for me as well. Okay. This. All right. Uh, let's move over to tri the trial of Magneto. It was trying. I will not deny that. You know, <laughs> this is another one where I wanted to like it so much better than the execution warranted, right? Mm -hmm. um, Why? I just, I thought, okay, cool, Magneto on trial. Let's see, let, let's see how this goes. But I felt like, I felt like they spent a lot of pages not getting anywhere on this one. Mm -hmm. Because, because we, we really, all we do is we get to the point where, they decide that Mag where, where they decide that Magneto's guilty, and then they come after him, right? Yes. You know, it's. I, I just felt like I felt like I spent a lot of time going not very far. Like like that should have been the very beginning, and I don't think. I mean, I, I think that it just should have been okay. It's Magneto, right? And then we get that hint at the very end that Scarlet Witch isn't really dead, which I guess is fine because we know she's. Not, they're not killing Scarlet Witch anyway, so. So yeah, I mean, on this, I'm, uh, you know, it's a, it's a stronger meth than than Way of X, but it's it's just like okay, we're here. Here's my thing. Okay, first of all, I'm reading an X Men book, which bleh, whatever. Uh, second of all, <laughs> um, we're saying now, after decades and after them literally being founding members of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, that Wanda and Pietro are not mutants. Okay, that's a 
that's a swing if that's what we're going to do. Sure, I guess. Whatever. But we invite Wanda to our fancy mutant party that goes on for 16 years in terms of comic books. Sure. Okay. And there, she's horribly murdered on an island full of people, resurrected after many of them were depowered by her and horribly mutilated. Okay. Yeah, that checks out. But the suspect, the sp suspect that they want to look at, the suspect they want to put on trial, the suspect that is most looked at is the person who's been considered her father and who she created an entire reality to make him the king of. Hmm. I guess. I mean, if you want to follow a very strict... But here's the thing, and I get that these are not professional law enforcement people. Um, when you look at a murder charge... You look at uh, how, you look at where, when, but most importantly, you look at why. What would be the motive? Why would Magneto kill her? Especially when, and this is, I'm just putting this out there, we have at least two people on the uh, field who can uh, synchronize, copy, or mimic the powers of other people. Second, we have at least, another, at least one other magnetic mutant who may have a beef against her because not actually being able to be considered Magneto's child when she really was. Just putting that out right. there, plan being that. And three, that... Uh, it, it, well, let me put it this way. There's, when cops see a, a quote-unquote criminal killed, they're like, oh, it's a shame. But when we look at the woman who depowered and caused essentially the murder of millions of mutants, all of a sudden this is a big deal. I'm not buying yeah. it. Not from this government. Not from the jerkish way that they've been acting. It doesn't. It doesn't add up. I also felt. Here's the thing that I felt like. There's some interesting beats here. Like one thing I thought was interesting is was North Star, North Star interacting with Quicksilver, that which we never surprise. get to see. Mm -hmm. I yeah. thought that was a really interesting moment, not only in, in, in how it showed Quicksilver's reaction, but how it humanized North Star, yep. right? You know, I thought that was amazing. I, I actually felt like, I felt like this, whatever the storyline is, should have been the first arc of X Factor. Hmm. Oh, that would have been interesting. But that then would have been had to hold off put, putting out the book, and they didn't want to do that. Or, or that could have been the current arc of X Factor. Just make it the an arc of X Factor, hmm. and have each issue, each issue be them going, you know, you know, going up and interrogating um, one of the many people who have magnetic powers who it could possibly be. Yeah. Right? Imagine imagine an issue where they're doing nothing but interrogating Polaris and they use we use that as an as an issue to really get into who Polaris is and 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 to lay out her relationship to Wanda, right? Mm -hmm. Allow allow Scarlet Witch to be this this um, prism through which to look at all of these different characters. To look at sync, to look at you know what I mean, like 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 all of these characters. That would be really interesting, right? That would be, yeah. Unfortunately, but, as Dick Wolf said, investigations are boring, and that's why he can only get a half hour out of them on every one of his shows. And he's right. been doing this for a thousand years, so. Well, but they well they could have. I, I I think they could have done it though. They could have done it. They could have done. They, they could have. I mean, because the nice thing is it becomes a way to. Um, it actually becomes not just about the trial, but it becomes about each of the suspects, right? Because mm -hmm. you can lay out, like, you know, narrow it down to six suspects. And then you, and then what it is, is, is each one becomes a story within the story, right? Um, you know, you might have some suspects that are just going to turn themselves in. Other suspects who are going to run, right? Um, you know, but that's... I guess that would require some, some brave storytelling. The other I'm thing that I things. thought... Yeah, the other thing that I thought was really interesting was they're like, well, we could actually resurrect, we could use our resurrection protocols on Scarlet Witch because for the longest time she was fooling Cerebro and thus we have a backup of her, right? I thought that was interesting because now we're, now basically what he's saying is we can resurrect anyone, we just choose to resurrect mutants. We can resurrect anyone who is scanned into Cerebro. The Cerebro made a copy right. of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, but that means only mutants, except with a few exceptions, right? Yes. But that, I'm wondering how, if they're going to follow up on that. And, I'm, and what I think would have been really interesting 
I mean, this would have been the other interesting thing that they really wanted to go somewhere. What if they went to Captain America and Vision and said, look, we need you to keep a secret here, but we could resurrect her, even though she'd be a corrupted copy. They would never say that to the Vision, because the Vision is a maniac and will do something insane. Okay, well, they I mean, pick an Avenger they could trust. You know, it would probably be Captain America, to be honest. True. Um, but but imagine, but that that becomes a really interesting moral dilemma. I felt I felt shortchanged by them just doing a quick up or down vote in less than a page on whether or not they're going to resurrect her. So they decide not to resurrect her. But if they could have resurrected her, then is it really a murder? Well, that honestly would be a good question for the way of X, but they don't quite have that together. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this, there you go, clouding the issue with facts again. Yeah, that's my, that's my job, apparently. Uh, this, uh, what you're saying would have been super interesting, but that wouldn't have been a book called The Trial of Magneto. That would have been the investigation of a murder. They want to right, jump straight would... past the investigation, straight to the trial, because a trial of Magneto sounds cool. So we're going to put right. Magneto on trial. So, of course, yeah, whether he's guilty doesn't really matter. What we're going to do is we're going to put him on trial because that's cool. And he's going to fight it. And he's going to be make speeches. And it, ooh, yeah, 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 let's do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, a, unfortunately, the wrong approach. This is not how law enforcement works. Even for a nascent and, and half-managed uh, 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 nation as, as Krakoa, this does not add up. Um, right. And... Looking at it that way, looking at it as not adding up, it's it's tiresome. It's really, it's frustrating in a way. It's tiresome. It's uh, incompetently done, which, you know, I like to watch people in, if you're going to wear spandex, you got to go out there and be competent. You can't be incompetent and look ridiculous. You got to pick one of the two for me. Mm. I'm sorry. Well, here's, here's a question that's kind of a little off the beaten path. Um, there is this publication, um, you may have heard of it, Bleeding Cool. Oh, I, I um, think I've heard of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. They, they ran this, the, this, this article talking about you know, Hickman leaving af basically after the first arc of his trilogy, right? Yeah. That being X-Men. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and there's some commentary about that. But I was wondering, what, what is your thought on the, on the idea that, like, that Hickman's leaving in part because we're still stuck in the first part of a three arc story because so many people like this arc that they don't want to let him go to the second arc. I don't believe that's why he's leaving. If memory serves the announcements that I saw from last week, Hickman is one of the many creators going digital in like a sub stack or something like that. So, and I also have some other inside information about how much these deals are, that they're backing up Brinks trucks to people's houses and saying, make comics and have fun. We just want to drive people to the to what we are, in the same way that right. Netflix initially did, um, for ill or for naught. Uh, so if he's leaving in the middle of this, it has, I would guess, less to do with sales or creative things and more to do with the fact that there's a Brinks truck full of money outside telling him he can do whatever he wants and own it. I get that. I'm not, and, I'm not, and I'm not saying that I completely believe the reason, but... What's interesting in the statement of the reason is this idea that we are stuck in the first, the first part of a three-part story. Yeah. There's a graveyard of stillborn story arcs that never got done. I mean, X-Men Legends was built on that idea. Uh, <laughs> for ill or for naught. Right. Um, uh, all over, you know, every possible type of entertainment media, you know, uh, we're... What, what do they say about Chinese democracy, the Bon Jovi album or whatever that you know never shows up or whatever? Um, we we'll never see we'll never see the issue of battle chasers that we're looking for. I'll put it that way. Right. Um, this is an unfortunate occupational hazard. Um, normally, with what I call big ticket books from Marvel and DC, you get some insulation from it as the company is big enough to absorb things and make changes, and will normally not leave things unfinished a lot, but you know, even there it happens. It is what it is. It's the nature of the business. So um, I'm not really, you know, well, let me put it this way. I don't begrudge anybody a check. If Hickman's going to go get one of them big checks, get that big check. I'm not mad at you. You should definitely get that big check. Um, it has great implications for diversifying the monopolized uh, nature of the comics industry. And it, uh, you know, makes, it forces change. So I'm fine with that. Um, with the X-Men in particular, 
I don't know. I don't know that enough of what this large arc three story vision was was even communicated out to the people who in charge. I know right. that they in the same way that you know. We can look at the original scripts that George Lucas carried around in his backpack that outlined stuff that did reach into episode seven and so on and so forth. But whether or not he was still going to do it that way, whether or not it was going to work, whether or not he you know, even had the wherewithal to understand it, or that he communicated that out to the people at Fox that he was working with, we don't know. And we can't. That's true. That's true. I, I, I do find it interesting. I mean, because I think that one of the things that... Um, that you and I are stuck on in terms of, of the way we're reacting to X-Men is that it feels stuck and it's not going anywhere, yep. right? They've got all these ideas and they're not really playing them out. They're only playing them out enough to make it look like you're moving forward, but they're really not, right? Yep. Um, you know, I mean, they, 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 I mean, I, it was interesting because they hinted at it in, way of, in the first issue of Way of X. Wow, these kids, they don't care about dying. What does that mean, right? Yep. But then they, they, it's like they're not being allowed to go forward with it, you know. But we'll see what happens. I mean, when, when Hickman's gone, we'll, we'll, we'll see, we'll, we'll see how, how much longer they stay on the island. Well, I don't, know, I don't know about, you know, people not being allowed. I think there's so many trains running now you know, with miniseries and other things that there's no focus. You can't focus on an idea long enough, even if you're in the middle of a miniseries, because you got to like, oh, the next train is coming. Got to make the donuts. Got to make the donuts. Got to make the donuts. Right. And that grind uh, is is challenging to be creative under. I'm not saying it's impossible, uh, but when a you are thinking, I don't want to make a character and not get paid for it, and be like, you know, what's the name, uh, 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 Brew Baker, not getting anything from Winter Soldier, uh, and and looking like a goofball. When that's not the nature of the game, that's not really what building myth is about. You know, you get paid, you do your job, and in some ways you build your own thing to do your own thing to ensure yourself. The industry doesn't really work. Uh, the, the way the industry works, they don't want to owe you anything. They don't want to give you anything as gratitude. That's not, I mean, ask right. Alan Moore. That's not how they work. So... Um, with that in mind, you know, people limit themselves and they limit the scope and they got to go make the donuts. And it turns out to be a very circular self, uh, uh, a rubrous sort of self tail eating situation. Eh, okay. If that's what they're going to do. But, um, I would personally, you know, I would call trial of Magneto a very low meh. Uh, and it's very frustrating because these books are very highly produced with a lot of money behind them and they just don't seem to be a thing. Okay, so 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 let's move on. What do you th what do you think of Moon Knight number three? Uh, not very much. Uh, <laughs> okay. I th I read it. I saw it, and it had my challenge with Moon Knight number three was its uh, climax. the The idea of okay, this is where the rubber meets the road, and this is where we're really going with this book, and this is how the struggle is resolved. What? What happened? What? Really? That's that's the fight. That's the big. That's the big thing. Oh, I'm. This is how I'm gonna beat you, bad guy. I guess, especially because right. the bad guy was the least interesting bad guy I think I may have ever seen in my life. He's literally, literally boring. And I was like, no, what? What is? We're, we're we we have Moon Knight fighting a janitor. That's the comic book you want me to read. That's what you're putting out. Okay, okay. Let's let's not let's not do that. Well, you know, ever 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 since I slipped on that um, slipped on that puddle of water in grade school, I've always I've always wanted to like get my revenge on the janitor. Stanford, yes. sir. Yes. It's time to stop. I, uh, why are you denying my trauma? <laughs> because the devil has more than enough advocates. <laughs> well, you know, I. I'm with you on this. I felt like, and and actually, I, I'm, and let me correct myself. This isn't Moon Knight number three. It's Moon Knight number two. Oops. Um, but um, <laughs> the fact that we could be on number two and feel like we're on number three says something, huh? It's a slog. Uh, you know, I'm. You know what? I'm. I'm just not yet sold on the world that they're building. This idea that that, that he is kind of like the Batman of the the Batman of all the things that go bump in the night. The contract Batman, even, yeah. 
you know, it's not it, it's it's not working for me. I mean, a lot of the elements do work for me. This idea that he's in therapy that works for me. Um, this idea that um, that that like there's there's another there's another that there's another Moon Knight or um, what's the other character that's working? Moon that's Monk or Moon Priest Hunter, or something. Or Hunter Moon. Or, or whatever, right? Like, that you've got that other character stalking him. That's cool. But we really don't see this other character who's stalking him other than two panels. We mm -hmm. see him in two panels, right? Um, they're just not putting it together. And I think that the world that they're putting together is one of those worlds that sounds... that works better on paper than it does in reality, right? Like, like in a pitch, it sounds great. But when you really start getting down to it, it's like, oh, we got to build a whole, like... You know, yeah, and there's and there's not a developed underworld, so everything's new. So like you have to, you actually have to create the janitor now, um, and so there's just a lot of stuff we got to slog through. That's just not interesting. Um, I think that I just think that, I, and I think that that's that's one of the problems that Moon Knight has. You know, is that they is that he's a he's actually a really interesting Marvel character that they don't know how to fit in the Marvel universe. Yeah, I mean, he doesn't have a well-defined. He doesn't have any real rogues gallery worth looking at. Um, he doesn't have a real clear mission. He doesn't really have clear reason why he's doing this or why he's this is even happening. And uh, despite a really remarkable visual design, there's also the and we've discussed this before the issue of cultural appropriation that plays into this. That's that's problematic. There's a lot of baggage, and there's not a lot of clarity for that baggage. So, you know, you or I could sit down with an official handbook of the Marvel Universe and pick out five weird, wacky, unusual things and throw them at Moon Knight and make them interesting. Give me, give me Necra. Give me, you know, um, I don't know. There's a whole bunch I could probably think of. And we could be like, oh, this is a thing. We can make this work. Okay, yeah, yeah. But instead, because we're making the janitor, we're like, it seems like we're really giving up here. Because if I'm this is like, the give me the Sphinx, give me Apocalypse, right? <laughs> give me Kang. <laughs> you know, like, like yeah, there we, are a but whole. We want him to win, though. <laughs> uh, but 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 that's that's where it gets interesting, right? Because he has to. He, he's got to. Be, you know, he's got to like. It, it's not about him like like subduing them physically. It's about him surviving these characters, right? That's not um, fair. You don't send Batman after Time Trapper. You don't do that. That's not what you do. Well, yeah, a good writer can, but oh, sorry. But nobody mind. does. I'm saying <laughs> nobody would. Say, I've been reading comics. Batman's not going after Time Trapper. <laughs> Kang is an unfair. That's like you know why are you going to jump to why are you going to jump to Bison when you you haven't even gotten past you know Saget or Zang or, or or Vega. What are you doing? <laughs> well. Those, that's just that, that's that's just um, that's just my thought. <laughs> that's just my thought. That's my story. I'm it's to it's it. three forty seven. We need to lighten around and get through this. We need to. Yeah. We, we, what are we writing the Moon Knight book? I'm calling it a meh because I just don't care. I'm calling it a meh as well. Now let's get to. I mean, we got two more book, two more Marvel books, and um, we're, we're working ourselves up in quality. Um, Guardians of the Galaxy the seventeen. Okay. Yeah, Guardians of the Galaxy. Okay, um, Guardians of the Galaxy is it needs focus. Uh, it's all over the map, and and you know there's this supposed inner struggle between oh I don't believe this person is good and we're gonna screw this up and I'm arguing all the time and I don't believe anything that you're saying and I won't work with that person and blah 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 blah. And I get, the the rationales make sense. They're within character limitations and they make sense for the character, but I'm not interested and I'm not entertained. Right. And for me, that's ultimately where the book stops. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I feel like the storyline is kind of starting to wear thin. Mm -hmm. um, but I haven't completely lost interest in it. It's still, I mean, we're, we're still in the midst of that intergalactic romp. I like that we, I, I do like that we, that we figured out why these planets, right? Oh, we're making, we're making a pentagram on a galactic. <laughs> scale right Gangster. i i thought that was awesome right i was like oh okay you know but but i do think i do think we're trying we're starting to slog around a little bit i think that we need i think we need to um 
we need to start wrapping it up or at least getting to or at least at least getting to some objectives right because we're still at the waving our hand waving our hands at things that are firing that are firing out of their eyes at us type stuff right mm -hmm. um and I, I do think we got to kind of move beyond that we've already established that that these that, that this adversary is gonna is is powerful and is wiping people out okay well, we got it let's let's move on I'm gonna give this above a meth though. Yeah, I'll honorable mention it. I think it's you know it's it's enjoyable enough. I just don't know if I would spend money on it. Enjoyable. If it was on TV and I was flipping the channel, I'm like, oh okay, I'll watch this. You know, for free. But <laughs> for money, nah, I don't think this is that good. All right, all right. So, what did you think of Kane the Conqueror number one? I was actually surprised at King the Conqueror because I'm reading it and I'm thinking it's going to be one thing and I get to the last page I'm like, oh, we're going to do a travelogue through all the Kangs because that'll allow us to put some background on what they're doing in the cinematic. Oh, I see why they would do that from a business standpoint. And like, I was enjoying the struggle of a young Kang versus an old Kang at first. And then when I got to that, I was like, oh, is this all we're doing? Oh, that's not interesting because now we're probably not going to see the old Kang anymore because he had his armor stolen and was left to get hit by a meteor. So, uh, spoilers. But, <laughs> I mean, is it really spoilers for a time traveler, though? I'm curious. No, I mean, I actually, I don't think we've seen the last of the old Kang because the old Kang has the memories of the young Kang, so he knows his armor's going to get stolen, so he's probably got a spare armor in the, in you know... <laughs> In other words, Kang knows that his younger self is going to drug him and steal his armor. So Unless he's got to have it. Unless right. he's a variant. Um, but I think, exactly. But I think, but I think that that's what's interesting. It's like, we know the old Kang is going to survive because he knows what the, he, because he's, he's looking at this young Kang, right? Mm -hmm. He's got a backup plan. All that, all that has to happen is, um, you know, you know, young Kang goes, you know, leaves him behind and then old Kang just reaches under the bed, pulls out and flips the switch, and he's safe too. I mean, that's the thing about time travel. Travel. Everybody knows everything. I don't mind the idea of doing a romp through the different Kangs because it's a confusing-ass history anyway. Um, I, I think that one thing that's kind of interesting about this, and I would have liked to have seen them do this, given, given who they're, they're using to play Kang in the cinematic universe, is have the young Kang be black. Yeah, a white Kang. I was like, oh, we're still doing that? Oh, okay. Yeah, we're still doing white Egyptian rulers? Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, but hey, I mean, I think that, I, I think that what they're trying to do is that they're, is that they're trying to show their diversity by having multiple white people take on, <laughs> take on Egypt, you know, because we got, now we've got Moon Knight coming out every month along with Kang. That made me really sad and made me want to stop talking about this. But what I, what I want to say is I will personally, though, honorable mention this book. Uh, I think the creative team is very strong. They make a lot of great character choices. There's great action scenes in this, the stuff with the dinosaurs. I mean, there's really, like, some clever ideas here and what's happening um, in the character motivation and how he got started. So I'm feeling a lot of that. I just, you know, from a personal sense, I really could take this book and then if it's going to really just, oh, we're just going to stop it. Next time Scarlet Centurion. Next time is Immortus. I don't need that. I don't need to do that trip. Um, I, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do you one better. I'm going to say buy this book. I think that, um, you know, all critiques aside about, like, what they're going to do with a white guy in Egypt, um, it, you know, Kang is still a character where there's a lot of interesting stuff to go into. Now the challenge is going to be, how do you keep the momentum within the storyline that you've laid out for the for the rest of the the rest of the series? You're right. Those challenges aren't in this book. You're right. Yeah. Hmm. So so yeah, I'm gonna give it. I'm I'm gonna give it a buy. Okay. Okay. Cool. 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 Comic books this week. Doctor Stanford Carpenter. Hannibal Taboo. What are we doing next? Uh, let's 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 slide on over to the to the independent stuff. Right. Um, we got this book called Radiant Black. You're gonna make me do this. Seven. You're gonna make me do this. All right, let's go. I mean, look, if you love the idea of Power Rangers and having a whole bunch of characters that are similar, that have similarly nebulous powers, each with a different color, um, fighting some other similarly nebulous, um, mean-looking thing that keeps showing up out of nowhere, 
this is your book and cursing right but if you want to if, if you want to read and enjoy a comic book this is not your book no no i i mean don't get me wrong i, I did a long thread on twitter this week about oh if you they won't let you do something go make your own you know saw off the serial numbers make your own thing but um the power rangers with all due respect didn't have a lot of meat on that bone in the first place you know i'm a soft target for kaiju and mecha and uh, martial arts and i don't like the power rangers not i don't dislike them i don't have any antipathy towards them but i don't have any passion for them either so if that couldn't connect with me uh, as big as that franchise is, and as much money as people put into making people like it, then really, did this really have the hope of, of connecting with these totally amorphous and half of them barely even explained who their characters are or why they're doing any of this to connect? I don't think so. Um, the first two issues of this series spent a lot of time making this kind of sad sack writer character up and, you know, kind of talking about his whole basically sad sack situation, which I was like, no, that's not how you world build. But uh, now there's no characterization. There's just drive, 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 go, 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 blast, 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 teleport here, teleport there, blah, 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 blah. They even called one of the characters pink at one point, like the pink ranger. And I was like, I get it. I know you, you love Power Rangers. You want to do Power Rangers, but this is not... It's 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 taking a, sl a slice of an already small pie, and that's not going to reach. It's not going to reach me at least, and I don't think I it's going to reach. I mean, I'm tell you, what, 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 one thing that was interesting was after reading this book, I was like, wow, this is like such a knockoff on the Power Rangers, and then I realized that there was a Power Rangers um, <laughs> issue out. Surprise! Issue, yeah, Power Rangers number Power Rangers number ten. So I was like, oh. I'm going to go check out Power Rangers number 10. What'd you think and of Power Rangers number 10 was the one Power Rangers issue that didn't have any Power Rangers in it. <laughs> so I just felt disappointed on all fronts. <laughs> there, cut you deep, Shrek. Cut you deep. <laughs> I mean, the only, the only good thing about my Radiant Black Power Rangers experience was that I texted you and got you to read them. That's mean spirited and, and hateful. And misery loves company. That's mean spirited and hateful, <laughs> and I don't like it. Uh, I will say the coloring on these books is really good, but let's move on because we're running out. We're down to like three or four minutes. All right. Uh, so I guess we're both saying. Uh, I'm saying lowest of meh because I I'm will saying, not remember these books. No, I'm saying God no. Okay, I'll allow on, on Radiant I'll Black and Power Rangers. Um, let's go to Tales from Harrow County. What did you think? Didn't couldn't get past the first page. Horror books I have a very hard time with. So I, I, I opened it and I was like, no, my brain isn't accepting this because I don't really get horror. So it's not like I'm saying it's bad because I don't know, but <laughs> I just don't get it. Yeah, I, I had a, um, it wasn't, I didn't think it was bad. I just didn't, I didn't know where it was going. And by the time we got to the end, I still wasn't sure where it was going. Um, I feel like the issue was really set up for something. Um, yes. Oh, did he cut but, out? And the hard, the hard part about this is, I don't feel that I could give it, uh, that I could judge it. I felt like I, I, I found something that just felt, like, I don't think I could say buy. I don't think I could say honorable mention. I don't think I could say meh. I don't think I could say don't buy. It just, it's something that just happened and I missed it. Then let's move on. All right, um, let's do um, let's do Time Before Time, number four. I enjoy Time Before Time. Time Before Time is a clever noir book with layers and and really interesting ideas on on the idea that criminal organizations have turf of whole decades of time. There's a lot of interesting things, that, and I thought this was a good installment that added layers to that and and really ratcheted up the urgency. I, on the other hand, I loved it. <laughs> I thought it was great. I know, right? <laughs> I, I want to say I don't like it, but I do. I mean, it is, I think that the art is amazing. I love the coloring. And mm -hmm. I, it had one of my, one of my all time, my, my, my favorite, my favorite visual scene. Um, aside, you know, my favorite cover was Nightwing. Mm -hmm. But my favorite actual scene in a comic book this week was the scene where he sh where he shoots old girl in the head? That's cold. It's cold. It's, 
but it's the way it's done. It's done in a way in which, like, like the style is one where it's not, it's not visually, it, it's not visually like realistic, right? Mm -hmm. um, and 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 her body's distorted in ways that that almost make her not even quite look human anymore. She looks almost like this stick monster, right? Yeah. But the way in which they capture the emotion of that of, of just that sudden turn and being shot in the head and that sense of shock and fear and everything all in that moment was just it it's that's a panel that's gonna stick with me. In the characterization of it, in making like a caricature, they made it more realistic. That's yep. really a that's really a clever trick. Yep, and, and and so so yet again, time before time is up on the buy pile. Bye. I agree. <laughs> yes. Uh, we got anything else? Because we got about like a minute left. Uh, didn't you want to talk about Compass number three? I wanted you to read Compass because it's a comic about an academic uh, dealing with the world around them, but I didn't get time to actually do it myself because I was really curious what you would think. I'm going to be digging into it while I'm pretending to listen to my day job meeting after I get off of this. Um, I liked it. Um, it's The weird thing is it's kind of not, not the best genre for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not. I really don't get 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 into the fanta into um, fantasy stories in comics as much okay. as I do superhero and science fiction. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm gonna say I enjoyed it. I liked what they're trying to do. I like how they're trying to bring in characters that are uh, you know that we think of as other, right? Like we yeah. don't talk about Muslims in the context of King Arthur's court. We don't talk. Um, you know, we don't talk about um, we, we don't talk about about the Mongols during during the time of King Arthur, but they were there, right? Were. And so I love that they're bringing in a Mongol and a and a Muslim character, and that they're both women. I I do like that. I I like what they're trying to do, and I'm gonna say one of the things I really loved was reading the back matter. Yeah, I thought deep. they did a really excellent job with the back with the um with the um with the back matter. So so yeah, I mean. You know, I'm, I'm I'm looking at this one like more power to you. It's definitely it's definitely on the we need to come back to this by pile. I respect that. I respect that. This is Dr. Stanford Carpenter with myself, Hannibal Taboo for comic books this week. We're here every week for about an hour talking about comic books that came out this week and sometimes a little bit a week before. Uh, please join the It's Complicated Club, the greenhouse over my head. These reviews will be posted on YouTube. So if you get down that way and you missed anything, you'll be able to catch up. Thank you so much for joining us. Stanford, any last thoughts before we close out? Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Y'all be safe now, and that is our show. Bye, everybody. Bye, Dr. Nick. <laughs>